research in French, the French uh, acronym is CNRS, uh, working at LUT, the laboratory of the universe and its series in English, uh, of the uh, observatory of Paris. Um, his, work, his research mainly revolves around Einstein's theory of general relativity, uh, the study of compact objects such as black holes and neutron stars, uh, and the theoretical modeling of sources of rotational waves such as compact object, objects in coalescence, also working uh, in the problem of dark matter in astrophysics and uh, cosmology. Well, without further ado, please welcome Professor Alexander, who will is now, oh, you can share his. Okay, bon dia. Bon dia. <laughs> um, vocês podem me ouvir? Sim. Ver até lá também? Sim. Uh, okay. You can, you can uh, speak English if you may. Okay, I'll speak English. Um, okay. Uh, eu, eu posso tentar uh, responder em português nas uh, perguntas depois. Se, se Seria ótimo. Eu posso falar tudo em português. Então, okay. vou mudar para inglês. Um, so first, thank you for the invitation uh, to come talk uh, at this um, uh, school. And um, thank you for the introduction, Gabriel. Uh, so today, what I'm going to try to do is give a sort of overview of uh, a fairly new experimental field, which is uh, gravitational wave astronomy, but a fairly old uh, theoretical science, because uh, gravitational wave is a very old prediction of the general theory of relativity. It dates back to 1916. And uh, by, by sheer coincidence, almost 100 years later, for the very first time, uh, gravitational wave were detected on Earth, on, on the ground, uh, following uh, literally decades of painstakingly long experimental and theoretical effort. And so today I'm going to try in, in, in one hour to summarize a bit of that theory and uh, of the observations that have been taken taking place uh, over the last uh, five years or so. So here is going to be the plan of the, the seminar. I will um, give a short uh, introduction of overview of the general theory of relativity and then of the theory of gravitational waves and basically how we detect them. And I will try to spend most of my time discussing uh, gravitational wave science, namely the the sort of science that we've already been uh, capable of doing uh, since the first observation in 2015. And I will uh, finish by talking about gravitational wave astronomy more broadly, uh, trying to, to open uh, um, on the future what kind of uh, science we will be able to do in the future, thanks to new observ observatories, for instance. So let's start with general relativity. So general relativity is the theory of space, time, and gravitation that was formulated by Albert Einstein in 1915. And uh, it's basically summarized by this very simple equation here, which relates the energy momentum content of the space-time to the curvature of that space-time, which is uh, characterized by the so-called Einstein tensor. So to understand general relativity, of course, you need to understand space, time, and gravitation. And over the last uh, century, uh, our understanding of the structure of space and time have changed a lot until special relativity, which was formulated in, in 1905, uh, physicists believed that uh, there was no such thing as space time. There was on the one hand space, three-dimensional, absolute Euclidean space, and on the other hand, time, Newtonian absolute time, the same for everyone. And in that space, a long time, uh, you have a motion of bodies here depicted as those blue and, and red balls. 
But following uh, the discovery of electromagnetism and in particular the, the equations of Maxwell and then the uh, experimental observation of the invariance of light speed in all the inertial frames, it was understood that the structure of space and time are in fact quite different. That there is no such thing as absolute space. There is no such thing as absolute time. There is only one four dimensional structure called space time, which is look, like, looks like a block and um, and particles move in space time describe world lines and this space time is characterized by a structure called the light cone which uh, is a set of uh, all even that can be reached uh, by light rays from one one event and the fact that massive particles cannot move faster than light translates into the fact that uh, any world line must necessarily be inside every light cone at any point along its trajectory. So that was the situation in 1905 with special relativity, which is the right framework to describe electromagnetism, for instance, and classical mechanics, but does not account for gravity. And 10 years later, Einstein realized that uh, to account for gravitation, one needs to relax uh, the constraint on the structure of space-time itself. One needs to give an additional property to space-time, namely curvature. And, uh, and, and gravity is in fact just the manifestation of the curvature of that space-time. And he understood this through the so-called equivalence principle, which was a, a thought experiment. And so to describe gravity, you, 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 you cannot set your space-time to be just a, a very specific variety, which is Minkowski space-time, which has no curvature. You need to allow for uh, a generic metric uh, to allow for some curvature. And it's only very locally near one event than this curved space-time will look like the flat space-time of special relativity. Another way to, to understand uh, this road to general relativity in, in terms of physics and in terms of geometry is through this little diagram where uh, you can start from pre-relativity physics, which uh, was uh, described in, in by, by Euclidean flat space. And if you add time, you can describe a flat space time, the Minkowskian geometry, which is the set setting for special relativity. And to go from the first to the second, uh, historically, the physical principle was the observation of the invariance of light speed. On the other hand, you know that you can generalize the flat Euclidean geometry to curved Riemannian geometry. And just the same way, if you add time in the picture, you can generalize the flat Minkowskian geometry into a curved Lorentzian geometry, which is the right setting to formulate general relativity. And physically, the way you go from this flat space-time geometry to the curved space-time geometry, that is from special relativity to general relativity, is through the equivalence principle. So the end result of this is Einstein general relativity, which is basically in a nutshell characterized, uh, summarized by this very simple tensorial equation where I've added the cosmos cosmological constant term compared to the earlier equation. And so on the right-hand side, you have the energy momentum content in your space-time, and on the left-hand side, how the space-time is going to curve in response to this energy and momentum that is in space-time. So this Equation tells that matter precisely tells space-time how it's supposed to curve. And an interesting consequence of this field equation uh, by using the so-called Bianchi identity, which tells you that the divergence of the left-hand side is zero, is that the divergence of the energy momentum tensor must vanish identically, which is a local conservation law, which, for instance, will tell how um, um, a particle will move in space-time. So the field equation also includes the information about the motion of matter. So space-time tells matter how to move. And in particular, if you take a massive particle which is subject to no external force, it's just freely falling in a gravitational field, it will follow a very specific path, a very specific world line in space-time, which is the so-called time-like geodesic. And a massless particle like a photon will also follow a geodesic but of a different nature, a so-called null geodesic. Well, that's it for general relativity. 
And a very important point physically to understand when you need to use general relativity, when is Newtonian gravity not a good enough description of the, physical, the gravitational physical phenomenon you're interested in. And uh, a good rule of thumb to have in mind if you want to address this question is to get a rough estimate of the so-called compactness parameter of the physical system you're interested in. So if you take any physical system and you want to characterize it as simply as possible by just its total mass and its characteristic size r, then you can compute a dimensionless quantity, the compactness parameter, which, which it, it basically gives you the strength of the gravitational field uh, that characterizes the system. And if this quantity is very small compared to one, then you know that Newtonian gravitation is going to be a good approximation because this parameter, in fact, gives you the relative corrections, general relativity corrections to the Newtonian prediction. So if you do particle physics, for instance, with a proton, uh, you can forget about uh, gravity and general relativity in particular. If you study physics near the Earth, well, the compactness parameter of the Earth is, is of order 10 to the minus 9, so the general relativity corrections to Newtonian gravity will be of the order of 10 to the minus 9, so unless you have extremely accurate measurements, uh, Newtonian gravity will be good enough. And this is, of course, the reason why uh, Newtonian uh, gravity was used since the 17th century until the beginning of the 20th century without uh, any need to replace that theory. Uh, if you go uh, more into the, the, the regime of uh, compact bodies like white dwarfs, neutron stars of black holes, you see that the compactness parameter can reach value of the order of one, in which case the Newtonian description would be really poor and you need to rely on general relativity or, or another relativistic theory of gravity. So this is all I wanted to say about uh, general relativity. I want to move now to gravitational waves and, and give a very simple definition of gravitational waves, which is that uh, a gravitational wave is essentially a tiny ripple in the curvature of space-time that propagates at the vacuum speed of light. So we saw that space-time has curvature, and in fact, what we call gravitation is just the manifestation of the curvature of space-time. Um, we know that a wave is uh, something that propagates with a certain speed. Well, a gravitational wave propagates at the speed of light, and it is a wave in the curvature of space-time itself. So it obeys, of course, a wave equation, which I've, I've written down here. The idea is that um, you will characterize this gravitational wave by, by a, a tensorial quantity, which I denote h, and it will obey a wave equation with respect to some background space-time, which could be flat, could be Minkowski space-time, in which case this term here will vanish. This is the background um, curvature of the space-time. So that would be zero for Minkowski space-time. And this wave equation, this is the ordinary d'Alembertian operator, has a source. It is sourced by the energy momentum content in your space-time. So the existence of gravitational radiation is one of the key predictions of Einstein's general, general theory of relativity. Uh, in fact, it was... Um, it was um, 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 well, whatever, <laughs> I forgot what I wanted to say. Um, another way to, to visualize this is through these space-time diagrams where I have one dimension of space here horizontally and a, a, and a dimension of time uh, vertically. So again, you have those two world lines for two particles. You have the light cones, uh, which uh, give you uh, the information about the structure of space-time. And a, a tiny ripple in the curvature of space-time, you can vil, visualize it here as this sort of uh, ripple in the sheet of space-time that propagates at the speed of light, that is to say, tangent to the uh, light cone here, to an outgoing wave in this direction. So gravitational waves share many properties with electromagnetic waves, but also have many differences. In particular, you know that an electromagnetic wave is an oscillation in the electromagnetic field that propagates in space-time, while a gravitational wave is an oscillation in the curvature of space-time itself. Electromagnetic waves are generated by the acceleration of electric charges, and typically the, 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 sorry, the wavelength of, of this radiation is much less than the typical size of the source, while um, 
gravitational wave are generated by the acceleration of large masses at relativistic speeds, and the characteristic wavelength is roughly of the order or larger than the size of the source. Moreover, the structure of the wave is dipolar in, electromagnetic, uh, in the electromagnetic theory, and uh, the coherence of the waves is typically low, um, while for gravitational waves, the dominant structure is quadrupolar and the coherence is quite high. But the most important difference from the point of view of detection is that electromagnetic waves interact very strongly with matter, which makes them uh, more easy to detect, while gravitational waves interact very weakly with matter. And the typical uh, frequency of the electromagnetic waves uh, one can uh, measure, for instance, in the optical or uh, ultraviolet, for instance, is quite high in such a way that one doesn't measure the amplitude of the electromagnetic wave. One measures the uh, time average of the, the electric field squared, that is the power in the field, which decays like the inverse uh, distance squared to the source. While the typical frequencies of uh, astrophysical sources of gravitational waves are low enough that you can actually track the time evolution of the amplitude of the wave itself. And so it decays like the distance to the source, which allows you to uh, reach further. So to summarize, if uh, one can see the universe thanks to electromagnetic waves, one could say uh, metaphorically that one can also hear the universe thanks to gravitational waves. And what is certain is that these are very complementary sources of information about the universe. So until five years ago, we basically were uh, deaf to the universe. We could only look at it, and now we can also listen to it, which of course brings uh, a whole extra uh, amount of information very different from what we could have before. Just like there is um, an electromagnetic uh, spectrum, there is a gravitational wave spectrum, which is shown here on this diagram with the wave period, or equivalently with the frequency of the waves in, uh, in Hertz. And depending on the, the sources, different sources will emit at different frequencies and you will be able to detect them by different means. For instance, for sources uh, whose typical uh, frequencies are between say 10 Hertz and a few kilohertz, uh, we use ground-based uh, terrestrial interferometers. I'll come back to this. And these will be sensitive to gravitational waves generated by compact binary system in our galaxy and beyond, such as the inspiral and merger of stellar mass black holes and neutron stars, but also isolated rotating neutron stars, or eventually the explosion of a massive star at the end of its life, giving rise to a so-called supernova in our galaxy. That should be seen as well by terrestrial interferometers. If you look at sources which emit at lower uh, frequencies, say between 10 to the minus 4 and 1 hertz, uh, you'll be interested in, in sending a, 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 a gravitational interferometer in space. And this is the idea of the project LISA, which I will describe later, which will see gravitational waves emitted by stellar mass compact objects orbiting around supermassive black holes Super, the supermassive black hole that live in the center of every galaxy, as you know, this year's Nobel Prize in Physics was uh, related to the discovery of a, um, a 4 million solar mass black hole in the center of our own galaxy. And LISA will also see the uh, merger of two such supermassive black holes anywhere in the universe, basically. If you look at gravitational waves at uh, lower frequencies, uh, you can use other uh, methods such as uh, pulsar timing arrays or the imprint in the cosmic microwave background polarization, but I will not talk about that in this uh, in this seminar. So the important point I will keep coming back to is that thanks to gravitational wave observations, we can do a lot of science. We can do fundamental physics, we can do astrophysics, we can do cosmology, and these are only a few points that I'm listing here. I, I'm not going to talk go through all of them right now because I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about them later. I'm going to keep coming back to those kinds of science. I'll just mention that over the last five years, we've already started doing uh, some of those uh, science points, which are indicated by the bullets here. I'll come back to that. So as you can see, this is a very rich class of science we can, 
we can do, thanks to gravitational wave observations. So the most promising sources of gravitational waves are shown here um, for interferometer, inter, interferometric detectors on the ground that already exist, such as LIGO and Virgo, but also LISA in the future in space. So here you have frequency on the x-axis and the typical gravitational wave amplitude on the y-axis. You see that the typical amplitude of the wave is very small, very, very tiny, typically between 10 to the minus 20 and 10 to the minus 22 or so. And we can hope to detect such tiny gravitational wave signals thanks to very sensitive detectors like LIGO, Virgo, or, or LISA. And, and most of the sources we'll be interested in will be the, the spiraling in the in spiral and merger coalescence of two compact objects, either binary neutron stars or neutron star black hole or two black holes with masses of the order of a few or a few tens of solar masses on the ground. Or as I said, supermassive black hole binaries uh, at lower frequencies with LISA or the in spiral of a stellar mass compact object into one such supermassive black hole. But to, to detect all of those waves, there, is, there are two very difficult challenges. One is an experimental challenge because you need to build extremely exquisitely sensitive detectors that can you know, measure gravitational wave uh, signals with such low amplitudes. So you need to, to get very low level of noises. And there is also a theoretical challenge, which is that you need to know in advance what the signal looks like so that you can hope to detect it in your noisy data. So this is illustrated, for instance, in this figure on the left, where I show one or alpha second of simulated noise in, uh, say, the LIGO detector with the amplitude of the noise here in uh, light blue. You see it oscillates like white noise, typically. And buried in this noise, you have a very tiny signal H in red, which you can't even see here. Let me increase the signal by a factor of 100 so that it can reach an amplitude which is comparable to that of the noise. Well, very clearly, if you don't know that there is a signal buried in there, you will not see it. In order to see the signal which is here, you need to already have a model that can potentially reproduce that signal. And what you want to do is perform so-called matched filtering. You want to cross-correlate the output of your data with a so-called template waveform, a theoretical signal. And if one such template matches a signal, a physical signal, which is in the data, then thanks to this match filtering, you will be able to filter out the noise and recover the signal, accumulate signal to noise ratio uh, by integrating over time a theoretical signal that matches an actual signal which is buried inside the data. This is why there is an actual need for a lot of theoretical work, which is the core of my, uh, my activity, to model as precisely as possible the shape of the gravitational wave signals you expect from a given class of sources. So this is not um, um, an imagination I have in my head. This is uh, an actual example of a gravitational wave even that was seen the 26th of December, 2015. You can see the signal here over, over lead on the actual noise in two uh, LIGO detectors uh, over one second of data. And you see that the typical amplitude of the signal is much less than the typical amplitude of the noise. So to actually extract this gravitational wave signal, it was necessary to perform this match filtering technique to accumulate signal to noise ratio over time up to the point where it's high enough that you can claim with confidence a detection. So how do we actually detect those gravitational waves using those uh, laser interferometers? Well, to understand that, it's really important to understand what is the effect of a traveling gravitational wave. So let's take the simplest case of a monochromatic gravitational wave, where I show the typical amplitude h as a function of time over one period, okay, which I did not capital T. And imagine that the wave is traveling in the plane perpendicular to the screen along the direction z here, perpendicular to the screen. And imagine that within the screen you have initially some circle of particles uh, like that. 
So what's going to happen is that as the gravitational wave propagates through the screen, it's going to deform this circle into an ellipse after one quarter of a period along deformed along one principal axis. Then it comes back to a circle. Then it's deformed into an ellipse along the other principal axis. And then it comes back to itself. So this is one polarization, one possible deformation due to a traveling gravitational wave if it has this very specific so-called H plus polarization. Another possible polarization is just the same, but rotated by 45 degrees. And the most general gravitational wave you can have is going to be a linear combination of those two polarizations. So a linear combination of those two effects. And the important point is that the typical relative variation in length, so, so how much the circle is going to deform into an ellipse, the relative variation delta L over L is given precisely by the amplitude of the wave. So if the amplitude of the waves is of the order 10 to minus 20, 10 to minus 21, and the detector has a kilometric size, that means that the size of the detector is going to change by just a fraction of the size of an atomic nucleus. And this is the kind of accuracy uh, that you need to detect the gravitational waves. And this is a kind of accuracy that current gravitational wave detectors can reach. There are currently four detectors in activity, two in the United States, the LIGO detectors, one in Europe, the Virgo detector, which is a collaboration mainly between uh, France and Italy, and also one Japanese detector underground, uh, under a mountain called Kagra, which is uh, just started taking data. And let me show you um, a nice animation about how those detectors work. Basically, those detectors are Michelson interferometers. So you have a laser source that sends laser, which is going to be um, splitted by a beam splitter in the middle. OK, so the, the laser is divided in two. Then you have two arms. The, the length of the arms is, is roughly of the order of three or four kilometers. There are mirrors at the end of each arm. The laser comes back recombine and you can adjust things in such a way that if the lengths of the arms are exactly equal they're gonna um, they're gonna there's gonna be destructive interference at the out at the uh, at the exit here and therefore there's gonna be no signal on your photodiode but if a gravitational wave path is through above the plane it's gonna change the length of each arm OK, that's the effect we just talked about. And therefore, one arm is going to be a bit longer and the other one a bit shorter and vice versa after alpha period. And this is going to change the interference pattern in your Michelson interferometer. And therefore, you're going to have a variation in the intensity of light at the output. And that is going to track the evolution of the amplitude of the gravitational wave. This is essentially how it works. So in practice, of course, it's way more complicated <laughs> because these are exquisitely sensitive instruments. For instance, in each arm, you have additional mirrors in addition to the ones at the end of the, um, of the interferometers in such a way that each arm acts like a fabri perot cavity, which allows you to increase considerably the amount of power that circulates inside each arm to increase the sensitivity of the measurements. And even this diagram is, is, is ridiculously simplifying the actual way those instruments uh, work. So that's all I'll say about the detection principle. I, and I want to move to the most interesting uh, aspect, which is um, the gravitational wave science, which we can do uh, thanks to those instruments. And I will uh, start by saying that uh, since 2015, there's already been three uh, observing campaigns by the LIGO and Virgo detectors. And over the last two observing campaigns, 10 signals have been seen. Nine of those are, correspond to the last um, orbits and, and, and merger of binary black hole systems. And one signal corresponds to the in spiral, sorry, and merger of a binary neutron star system. So the 10 um, binary black hole uh, systems are summarized here. You can see the signals. The characteristic form of the signal is that uh, the amplitude and frequency of the signal increases with time. 
until you reach a maximum when the bodies merge, and then you have a decrease in amplitude uh, until you settle down to uh, no signal. And physically what happens is that the two black holes are spiraling in until they merge to form one black hole, just like two bubbles will merge to form one bubble, and the remaining deformed black hole will emit a last burst of radiation to reach an equilibrium state, so-called Kerr black hole state, at which point there is no more gravitational wave emission. And, and this is the signal for the binary neutron star, which lasted, as you can see, for several tens of seconds, about a minute, while the signals from the binary black holes lasted for about a second or a fraction of a second. And this is very much related to the fact that black holes are much more massive compact objects than neutron stars. So given how strictly important this is, I want to spend a bit of time talking about the first event, which occurred the 14th of September 2015 and was seen by the two LIGO um, instruments. So you see here the amplitude uh, of, the, of, of the, I mean, the output, right? The data output in the, in the two detectors in blue, uh, sorry, in red and in blue. Uh, here in orange is superposed the, the signal in red. And you can already see the oscillations here that accumulate in phase in the two instruments. So this is the same astrophysical signal which is shown here, which is buried inside the data of the two different interferometers, which are at two very different locations on, on, um, on Earth. And if you subtract this astrophysical signal from the data stream in the two detectors, you get something here which is compatible with noise. Here you have a, um, a spectrogram which shows the evolution of the frequency of the signal as a function of time with a characteristic chirping behavior, sounds like this. Increase in frequency and, in, and, and amplitude as a function of time. This is very characteristic of the spiraling and, and merger of two black holes or two neutron stars also. But depending on, on how fast this occurs, it tells you if, if actually these are black holes or neutron stars. Um, I, I don't show it here, but the significance, the stati statistical significance of the event is very high. It's larger than five sigma to, to borrow from the vocabulary of particle physicists. So this was indeed um, a very confident detection of an astrophysical gravitational wave signal. And when you interpret that signal, you understand that it corresponds indeed to the, spir to the in spiral merger and ring down of uh, two black holes. And, and by analyzing precisely that signal, you can figure out that the two masses of the black holes of the order of 30 solar masses, and they merge to form a black hole of the order of uh, uh, 60 or 70 solar masses. In the process, the actual orbital velocity reached a significant fraction of the speed of light and between a third and half of the speed of light during the last orbits. So this is quite crazy because a, a SETI solar mass black hole has a typical size of a, um, uh, something like, a, um, well, a city like Paris, maybe. So it's, it's, it, it's tiny on astrophysical size. 30 times the mass of the sun in just a city. And you take two of those uh, gargantuous objects and they spiral around each other, extremely close to each other at the end. Uh, and, and they orbit at roughly uh, half of the speed of light. So they go around each other uh, several hundred times per second right before they merge. And in the process, they emit uh, three times the mass of the, the mass energy of the sun in, in gravitational waves. So why is it such a big deal, this detection? Well, because this is the first direct detection of a gravitational wave from the cosmos. So 100 years after the prediction, and this was a major prediction of the general theory of relativity. But in my opinion, most importantly, because this is the most direct and most robust proof of the existence of black holes, way more than the indirect proof you get by receiving electromagnetic radiation from matter that's falling around uh, a black hole. It's also the discovery of the first binary black hole system. We didn't know for sure that such system existed. And it, it also allowed for the first time to perform so-called 
strong field tests of general relativity, namely testing the prediction of general relativity, not in a regime of a weak gravitational field like in the solar system or in cosmology, but when the gravitational field is so strong that uh, the Newtonian theory of gravity uh, makes uh, predictions that are useless. So I'm going to start now talking about this long list of uh, gravitational wave science that we can um, do thanks to gravitational observations. And the first one is strong field test of GR. So for instance, thanks to this first signal, you can test uh, that things are consistent in terms of the final mass and spin of the black hole that resulted from the merger. Um, so here the, you have the final mass in solar masses, and here you have the final spin as a fraction of the maximum possible spin of, uh, of a black hole. And, and what's shown here as in spiral corresponds to the possible value inside that region for what the final mass and spin should be given the initial masses and spin that you could measure from the in spiral part of the signal. And independently, here in blue, the post in spiral corresponds to the measurement of the final mass and spin you get from just the last part, the ring down, when you have one final black hole that is a little bit perturbed and will emit a last burst of radiation as a sum of so-called quasi-normal modes, basically uh, decaying sinusoids, whose characteristic uh, oscillation frequency and decay time are uh, uh, completely characterized by the mass and spin of the perturbed black hole. And you see that there is an overlap region uh, that's compatible with the inferred uh, value for the final mass and spin uh, using a model which accounts for the full in spiral merger ring down. So that's a consistency test of the waveform, for instance. Another interesting test is to constrain the so-called post-Newtonian parameters that enter the phasing of the wave. Uh, the idea behind these post-Newtonian parameters is that the gravitational wave um, template that you use to make the detection has an in-spiral phase in which you can describe um, the general relativistic corrections as, uh, like I said, corrections to a Newtonian, uh, leading Newtonian prediction. And, and those corrections appear at different orders in powers of uh, one over C that corresponds to the different post-Newtonian orders here. And you can set bounds on deviation from the predictions from GR in particular, you see that, for instance, at this 1.5 pn order, you have a test at 10% of the accuracy of a, a general relativistic effect, uh, which is a so-called tail effect that corresponds to the fact that the gravitational radiation doesn't propagate in flat space-time, but in a curved space-time. It back reacts on the uh, background curvature of, uh, of the source. And so you, you, you see no deviations uh, here from the prediction of general relativity at the 10% level for this uh, purely general relativistic effect. So this is just the first test we do with the limited amount of uh, accuracy we have uh, with the first detection, but of course with more sensitive detectors and more events, we'll be able to improve upon the accuracy of those tests. Uh, let me now describe another um, very important signal uh, that was seen uh, in 2017 in August, uh, which is the merger of two neutron stars, which allowed us for the first time to, oh, sorry, I'm going too fast. I want to talk about the formation and evolution of compact binary systems using still uh, binary black hole systems. So on this diagram, I'm showing the masses of the various black holes we know and also the various neutron stars. Well, until 2015, the only black holes we know were inferred through electromagnetic observations with typical masses between five and 10 solar masses. And thanks to gravitational wave observations, you see that now there is an entire new family of black holes, which we know with masses roughly between say 20 and 80 solar masses. And, and those, correspond to those 10 uh, uh, couples of binary black holes that have merged to make heavier black holes. So if you ask uh, an astrophysicist that, who is a specialist in stellar evolution, um, how you make a black hole of say 30 solar masses, 
uh, out of uh, the remnant of a supernova, this is not uh, very easy. So already the first detections uh, could be used to set, um, well, to um, could be used to to make us think again about what we think we understand about how stars evolve. Let's put it this way. You also see here two neutron stars that merge to make one uh, more massive object, most probably a, a black hole. I'm going to talk about that even. That's the first binary neutron star system that was observed in 2017. Um, this year, um, thanks to the third observing run of LIGO and Virgo, additional um, compact binary mergers have been seen, including this very interesting event that coincides with the in spiral and merger of a 20 or so solar, solar mass black hole with a 2.5 or so solar mass compact object to make um, some black hole with a mass of 25 solar mass or so. And what is remarkable about this event is that 2.5 solar mass is quite high for a neutron star, but quite low for a black hole. So this is either the most massive neutron stars neutron star that has been uh, observed or the least massive uh, black hole that has been observed. And according to the theory of uh, stellar evolution, um, there shouldn't be, in principle, black holes with such low masses. A black hole should have a mass roughly of order three or more solar masses, but 2.5 is very low for, for a black hole. So this is, again, a gravitational wave event that triggers very important question about stellar evolution and formation of compact objects. Another even that was seen during the third observing run is the merger of two already very heavy black holes. You see here masses of the order of 70 or 80 solar masses, and they merge to make a black hole with a mass of order 160 solar masses. Well, this is huge, 160. This is already, you could call that an intermediate mass black hole. It's not a stellar mass black hole. It's not a supermassive black hole. It's a new class of black hole that we were not sure existed. Thanks to this observation, we know they do. OK, so let me now talk about the origin and mechanism of uh, short gamma ray bursts. And to do that, let me introduce an event that took place the 17th of August, 2017, a bit more than three years ago. So what happened that day is that the LIGO and Virgo detectors observed this beautiful chirp here frequency as a function of time. Uh, it was seen for about one, one minute. And, and this is a characteristic signal of the in spiral of two neutron stars. And less than two seconds later, the uh, X-ray satellite uh, Fermi, sorry, the gamma ray satellite Fermi observed a short pulse of gamma rays. And it was realized that there is a common source for those two events that were almost simultaneous. Here you have a map of the sky, and you see in blue here the region of the sky that Fermi said the, sh the short gamma burst was coming from inside that region. And then you have this light green banana that corresponds to the location of the gravitational wave signal as seen by LIGO, either that banana or that banana. And if you add also, the Virgo detector, you increase the accuracy on the localization of the source of the event in the sky. You can infer that it's not here. It has to be in this darker green region, which coincides with the field of view of, of, of Fermi. And in this very specific place, there is a galaxy, NGC 4993, which uh, uh, was observed later using uh, optical telescopes, for instance, and there is this bright point that just uh, lighted, um, which was not there before. And this is, in fact, uh, the electromagnetic uh, counterpart of this gravitational wave signal, which resulted from the spiral and merger of two neutron stars. So this was really the birth of multi-messenger astronomy, because for the first time, we could see, thanks to gravitational waves, uh, an astrophysical phenomenon, like this spiraling and merger of two neutron stars, which was then seen immediately after through a short gamma ray burst and over the 
the hours, days, weeks, and months later to the entire electromagnetic spectrum from X-rays to radio. And so a lot of information was gained through this multi-messenger observa observation. It's a big deal for many reasons. One, because it's the first observation of a binary neutron star merger. This, they have never been seen until now. Sorry, uh, Alexander, just to remind you, 10 minutes yep. of, of last 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay, thank you. Yes. Um, it was also uh, a confirmation of the link which was uh, formulated, uh, hypothesized a long time ago that the progenitors of short gamma high bursts are indeed the mergers of two neutron stars. And by observing the uh, electromagnetic counterpart, it was possible also to give support to the theory of so-called all process nuclear synthesis, which uh, states that basically half of the heavy elements of the universe are produced in such events and not just during a, a supernova. And, and many other kinds of signs that I'm gonna talk about uh, briefly. Uh, one is uh, a very interesting independent measure of Hubble's constant, which is maybe the most important parameter in cosmology that describes the rate of expansion, the current rate of expansion of the universe, uh, measured in uh, kilomet kilometer per second by, by megaparsec. And you probably know that the Planck satellite observing the cosmic microwave background radiation gave a very precise measurement of the Hubble constant of the order of six, 67 kilometer per second per megaparsec. While the observation of the type 1a supernovae uh, gave another measurement of the order of 72 kilometer per second per megaparsec. And there is some tension between the two measurements. And thanks to this multi messenger observation of a binary star merger, it was possible to infer both the distance of the event and the redshift. And therefore, by taking the ratio, the, uh, to estimate the, the, the Hubble constant without any bias on the luminosity distance, which is usually the, the thing which is hard to, to measure. So you see that the accuracy of the measurement is not very good. It's of the order of 10%. Uh, and it's interestingly right in the middle of the two uh, previous measurements. But of course, with more such observations and better accuracy, uh, this uh, error bar will reduce considerably with the years and, um, and, uh, and possibly uh, try to, to, to give the final world on this uh, observed tension on the value of H naught. Um, another interesting thing you can do is, uh, is uh, falsify alternative theories of gravity, simply because the gravitational wave signal and the electromagnetic uh, signal, um, the gamma high burst was seen with such a small time difference less than two seconds, while they are, the, the, the event took place so long ago at such a far away distance, it tells you that the speed of gravitational wave has to be extremely close to the speed of uh, electromagnetic waves. In fact, the bound is less than 10 to the minus 15. So any alternative theory of gravity that predicts uh, a, a, um, a speed for gravitational wave different from the speed of electromagnetic waves uh, that's not compatible with this bound is already non-viable. So it excluded a lot of alternative theories. Very powerful uh, constraint coming from this measurement, this observation. So I'm gonna skip this discussion of the internal structure of neutron star because I think that the next speaker will talk about this in much detail. So I'll, 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 I'll move on to with the time I have to discuss the future of gravitational wave astronomy. So we have a network of gravitational wave interferometers, the LIGO detectors in the United States, the Virgo detector and GEO in Europe, one LIGO detector which will be moved in India, and the Japanese Kagra detector. Uh, those detectors are becoming more and more sensitive, and improving the sensitivity by a factor of 10 means improving the volume you can observe by a factor of 10 to the 3, and so the even rate by a factor of 1,000. So we've already finished the third observing run uh, in March uh, of this year. And now there's gonna be uh, a pause for upgrade uh, until the fourth observing run will start probably in 2021 with the LIGO, Virgo and Kaga detectors. And what you can expect um, uh, with those improvements is not just uh, dozens of events, but probably hundreds of events because 
This is showing you that during the third observing run, the cumulative number of events over a bit less than one year was something like uh, 60. So this is the number of, of detections and non-retracted alerts. So there's probably not going to be you know, a new catalog with an additional 60 events, but certainly uh, several tens of events in the, in the second catalog, thanks to the third observing run. And by improving further the sensitivity of the detectors, of course, there's going to be way more events uh, in the years to come. But I think the most exciting part has to do with what's going to come uh, in space with the LISA project, the project to send a, um, 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 an interferometer in space in orbit uh, around, uh, around the sun following the Earth. So the LISA mission is not a proposal. It was actually selected by the European Space Agency in, uh, three years ago and will be launched in principle in 2034, hopefully a bit before. LISA will be sensitive to gravitational waves at much lower frequencies between 10 to the minus 4 hertz and 1 hertz or so. And as I mentioned earlier, LISA will see uh, the coalescence of supermassive black holes basically everywhere in the universe, but also the, the in-spiral of stellar mass compact objects into massive black holes. It will also see tens of thousands of binary uh, white dwarf systems in our own galaxies and hopefully uh, sources of gravitational wave uh, of cosmological origin very, very near after the Big Bang. One very interesting thing that will become possible thanks to LISA is to do multi-band gravitational wave astronomy. Imagine that you have a binary black hole system that you see with LISA. You infer the parameters. You can then infer when it will end up merging in the LIGO or Virgo band. And so you can tell in advance where to look in the sky and at what time, which will considerably improve the accuracy of the measurement on the ground. So the most exciting part uh, in terms of science that one can do with uh, LISA, in my opinion, because this is what I'm working on, is to test the black hole no hair theorem, according to which um, black holes are only characterized by their mass and spin. And just like you can measure the multiple moments of the Earth by tracking the motion of satellites around the Earth doing geodesy, etymologically measuring the Earth, you can track the shape of a black hole uh, by measuring the gravitational wave signal that comes from the motion of a stellar mass compact object around that supermassive black hole. And then you can do what I invented, uh, <laughs> I guess, it's botrio meladesi which is the science of the measure of the shape of a black hole. And hopefully we'll be able to test if indeed the black holes in nature uh, are characterized only by their mass and spin. Um, LISA will also allow to test for the origin and growth of supermassive black holes. As I mentioned, um, LISA will see basically the coalescence of all binary black holes, supermassive black holes in the universe with ridiculously high signal to noise ratios, even at cosmological distances corresponding to redshift of several tens. And uh, I think I'm getting to the end of my um, time. So I will, um, I will stop there. And if there's time for question, I'll be happy to try to, to answer them. Oh, thank you very, very much for your talk. Um, uh, so, questions. We have already questions. Uh, oh, I would like to remind everyone because um, the language of the uh, um, event is we, we chose to be English, but feel free to ask in whatever question, in whatever language you want. Uh, então, vocês podem falar português à vontade, não tem problema nenhum. Uh, we have a question from, let me see, uh, Caroline Lima. Ela perguntou. Por que essas duas polarizações não são perpendiculares entre si? Sou estranho uma onda gravitacional ser a combinação linear de duas polarizações não perpendiculares entre si. Então, eu imagino que a questão está relacionada com isso. Uh, e isso é relacionado com o fato que o um, a, 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 Particle, <laughs> the particle associated yes. with the gravitational wave, or graviton, um, tem um spin dois, 
Um, and, wow. Well, it's really difficult for me <laughs> in Portuguese. Okay. So, <laughs> about physics. Uh, I tried. <laughs> so um, the the fact that the two polarizations are rotated by forty five degrees has to do with the fact that the elementary particle associated with the um, gravitational wave, which one may call the graviton, has a spin two. So it's related. It's a, it's a notion in particle physics um, called the helicity. And um, well, I invite the the person who 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 asked that question to to look into that question of uh, spin of, of particle to understand why it's forty five degrees and not ninety degrees. If that was the question. Um, okay, there is also um, a question from Ruben. Uh, oh, Caroline said thank you. Um, Oh, I just lost the question. Oh, the question. Is there the possibility of observing gravitational waves from the black hole of our galaxy? Uh, I hope so. In fact, a few years ago, I think it was last year, um, together with uh, colleagues, I got interested in the question of whether Lisa could see the gravitational wave emission from some a stellar mass body orbiting around the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. So we know that there is a, a supermassive black hole uh, at the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A star, whose mass is uh, something like 4 million solar masses. And if you look at the kind of gravitational wave frequency uh, that corresponds to uh, a body in close orbit around that supermassive black hole, it's exactly in the maximum of sensitivity of the lizard detector. It's actually a coincidence, but it's a remarkably nice coincidence because if there is such a stellar mass body orbiting uh, our supermassive black hole, we know where to look, we know the direction, um, we know the distance of the event. Uh, so it's quite simple to do the data analysis. And uh, we could tell uh, in this work that um, indeed Lisa will see uh, such an orbiting body around the supermassive black hole if, if there is one. The only question is, is, is there such a compact body like a neutron star or, or black hole or, or even possibly a, a white dwarf or even a, a brown dwarf, which is not compact, but a brown dwarf which would be close enough would be seen through its gravitational wave emission by LISA. So I also have a question, are there sources of gravitational waves other than binary systems? Are we expecting yes, it? Um, indeed they are. I focused on this, but uh, there are other sources. Um, for instance, uh, one very interesting source I didn't mention is uh, from um, uh, quantum fluctuation in the early universe. So if, if the universe has been through a phase of inflation shortly after the Big Bang, uh, there were quantum fluctuations, including in the tensor modes, and that should have given rise uh, to a stochastic background of gravitational waves that hopefully we could see um, through terrestrial interferometers or possibly space interferometers like these are, or possibly also the imprint in the cosmic microwave uh, background polarization. But um, the, pr the predictions uh, vary a lot uh, about the amplitude of such an F because it depends on, on the kind of physics that occurred shortly after the Big Bang. And this is a, still a very open question. But this is a kind of signal that people are looking for. Another completely different kind of signal would be a monochromatic gravitational wave coming from a little inhomogeneity in the distribution of matter in an isolated spinning neutron star. So that would emit basically a gravitational wave with a frequency which is twice the spinning frequency of the neutron star. And uh, we hope to see that uh, with ground-based detectors. Also, if a massive star explodes in our galaxy anytime, could happen anytime, and the detectors are online, uh, we will see that uh, the gravitational wave signal that comes from that supernova in principle. The only problem is that it, on average, that happens once every every century. So it could happen, you know, <laughs> several times in a week, or maybe we'll have to wait for 300 years, so very hard to predict. And of course, the most interesting is the unknown, because anytime you start observing the universe with a new um, 
method of observation, anytime you know we started looking at the universe with radio or X-ray, gamma ray, or anything you want, or um, cosmic rays and so on, we we made unexpected discoveries. We saw things we were not expecting. So right now we're starting to see in gravitational waves the thing we expected. Of course, at some point we're going to see things we didn't expect because nature is always more creative than all of us combined. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, one also a question from Pedro Bitar. Uh, is the neural hair theorem a statement about black holes only at their stable configuration, or does it apply to the intermediate merger configurations too? Or can you do the shape analysis of these merger shapes too? I'm not sure I understood the question, so I'm going to try to address it. Hopefully, that will correspond to, to what was uh, uh, asked. Uh, the no hair theorem is a statement about equilibrium black holes in general relativity, stationary black holes. And more specifically, what the no hair theorem says is, is that in four dimensions in general relativity, if you have a stationary black hole, it must be a, a, a curved black hole. It must be a member of the family of solutions of the Einstein equation called the curve solution, which is characterized by only two numbers, which physically correspond to the mass and spin, or you can add electric charge if you wish, but that's astrophysically irrelevant. And, um, and so an equilibrium, a stationary black hole in GR, so not perturbed by anything around, around him, around it, um, will be characterized exclusively by its mass and spin, including all of its multiple moments. And this is shown in this very nice formula, the so-called Hansen formula, the mass type and current type moments of a black hole of functions only of the mass and the, and the specific spin. A is, the, is the, the spin, angular momentum divided by the mass. Um, now, if you, if you tidally perturb a black hole, it's gonna respond to that tidal perturbation and develop multiple moments. In fact, this is uh, ongoing work I'm doing with a colleague who works um, in Rio de Janeiro. And, um, and, and generally speaking, the motion of a, of a small body around a big black hole uh, will be a function, of course, of the gravitational field in which the small body moves. So it will be a function of the multiple moments of the central body. And, and the gravitational wave emission will, that you can detect with LISA will encode information about those multiple moments. Um, so this is the, the sense in which, thanks to to LISA and to those extreme mass ratio and spirals, we will be able to test if the multiple moments of the central body are indeed those of a, of a black hole or of another compact object. If the, if the question was about more comparable mass black holes, uh, well, in that case, they are extremely deformed. They are very to each other and comparable masses. They are very deformed. They are very far away from being in an equilibrium state. And there is no reason why they should be characterized only by mass and spin in that more dynamical situation. Well, once, once again, we would like to thank you very, very much for your talk. And also I invite everyone, also uh, Alexandre, to go to the Slack channel to discuss every uh, uh, one of the speeches. Um, and so, so that's it. I think we are having a, a, a coffee break right now. And Shall I uh, stop sharing my screen? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh. É, oi, pessoal. Então, agora a gente vai ter o coffee break, o nosso primeiro coffee break. Antes disso, o Matheus vai disponibilizar no grupo, do, no chat agora do Zoom, a lista de presença para o período da manhã para as pessoas que se inscreveram no evento. Só para a gente ter um controle de quem está acessando e etc. Então, por favor, é, olhem o chat agora, que já está a lista de presença do período da manhã. No período da tarde, a gente vai fazer a mesma coisa no primeiro coffee break, ok? Do, da tarde. É, então, vocês podem ficar livre para ficar aqui na sala mesmo esperando. É só 15 minutinhos, então podem ficar por aqui ou se quiserem sair e depois retornar, não tem problema.